Howdy folks and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Monday, October the 3rd and I have the very distinct honor and great pleasure of welcoming to the show for the first time uh, Mr. Willem Middlecope and he is the author of a number of books including uh, If the Dollar Falls in 2007, The Permanent Oil Crisis in 2008, Surviving the Credit Crisis in 2009, Gold and the Secret of Money in 2012, and of course, The Big Reset, which was penned in 2013 and revised in 2015. And uh, Mr. Middlecope is also the founder of a Dutch-based fund called Commodity Discovery Fund. And Willem, welcome to The Daily Coin. Well, thanks uh, for having me. Great to be here. Well, I'm certainly glad, and I appreciate you taking time out to uh, speak with us today. And the first question that I have is a combination of uh, myself and a uh, good friend. You may know him, Larry White. He's over at the LoneStarWhiteHouse.com website. And uh, we have uh, seen the Federal Reserve's bubble economics run about a seven to eight year cycle beginning in pr- approximately 1980, meaning about every seven to eight years, the U.S. economy and the rest of the world, to a lesser degree, gets a shock to the system in some form of economic bubble bursting. And it has been over eight years since the last bubble burst. Is the reason China has been pushing as hard as they have for the release of the MSDR due to the fact that we are about to experience the latest and greatest bubble bursting that could lead to the big reset that you that you are expecting, or what kind of time frame does your analysis point to as indicating the next major crisis? Um, yeah, just last night I sent out a tweet uh, pointing that, um, well, crashes, large corrections can come in waves, and the first wave was 2000, 2003. That was the implosion of the internet and tech bubble. The second um, large correction was the uh, credit crisis after the fall of Lehman, 2007-2008. And I think we're on the verge of the start of a new crisis and that could well develop this year in 2017. So we, I see the same seven-year time span. Um, but I think that the coming crisis um, may not be the last crisis in this huge, well, uh, end of the U.S. uh, high times, as we could say. Uh, I think uh, China, uh, Europe, and the U.S., all combined within the IMF, they're willing to... um, print some uh, uh, extra money worldwide, which could give the system a few more years before we, we, we could reach the point that we need a full monetary reset. From the research that I've conducted, uh, Willem, the, the Chinese are not interested in a world reserve currency system. And how serious are the Chinese about instituting the SDR substitution fund that you've recently written about and is the msdr bond just the the first in a series of stepping stones to begin converting u.s treasuries into sdrs and uh, and moving the world slowly and steadily out of the world reserve currency system and towards an sdr world currency yeah, the, the Chinese are not too happy about the current dollar um, world reserve system. And the Chinese have been quite vocal and open about their wish to change the international monetary system um, towards a next phase in which the um, currency basket by the IMF, the SDR, the special drone right, we could say that's IMF money, will be used as a successor for the U.S. dollar. So the Chinese want to upgrade the SDR 
and uh, to bring much more liquidity into the SDR. But first, they had to convince the US and the IMF to um, really work together to, um, you know, to bring these changes to the international monetary system. From uh, Saturday, last Saturday uh, this week, from October 1st, the renminbi is added as a fifth currency to the SDR. Yes, All the yes. currencies are the dollar, the pound, the yen, and the euro. Uh, I think it's Chinese wish to also add gold as a sixth currency, but I think we need an, another crisis for that to uh, to to happen. And um, it's Chinese wish to convert dollars into SDRs through a substitution fund. Um, in the 1970s, the U.S. have proposed sub such a substitution fund. Um, so countries who had too many dollars in the financial reserves could exchange them for SDRs. And I think this plan could be introduced um, within a few years by the IMF. And this would be a great solution to get rid of too many uh, dollars and exchange them into SDRs. So SDR will become a very liquid um, uh, asset, and that's needed to become a real-world reserve currency. But you should um, remember that these changes often take 5, 10, 15 years. So don't expect this to happen in, a f in the next few quarters. Yeah, and here it is, October the 3rd, and the dollar is still functioning. The sure. world is the world hasn't blown up or fallen apart as many people predicted and and life goes on. Yeah, people always expect these changes to occur very soon and they always expect a huge crash. Well, I don't expect a huge crash because um, central banks worldwide are ready to print enormous amounts uh, amounts of money. So when we need 10 trillion extra, 10 trillion more will be created out of thin air. And there's only one limit to this whole cycle of money printing, and that's when the general public, Joe Sixpack, starts to lose trust in fiat currencies. But I don't see that around me. But only the insiders, the um, ultra net worth individuals, and some smart guys, um, uh, they, they are questioning the value of fiat money. I would I would tend to agree with you to a point. I think that there that the number of people that are losing confidence in the central banks around the world is growing. Uh, Joe Sixpack is is no longer while while they're still accepting of the system that's currently in place. They're beginning to ask questions around the fringe, and I, I see that growing. I hope that that it continues to grow. I hope those can questions continue to grow over the over the next uh coming year or two three whatever it takes for them to be become more educated but it's still a small percentage of the people and i think central bankers are not really uh, worried about uh, loss of confidence at this point yes I, I would agree with that and uh the next question that i have uh willem is a it's a combination of a gentleman named uh, rusticus and he has a website called stateless homesteading and it's a combination of question of of him and myself and if i understand correctly willem uh you are in regular communications with some of the people that are currently working with and former imf officials and what are you hearing that you can share regarding how hard Chinese officials are pushing to include some gold backing of the SDR. I mean, I've heard it battered, batted around that there's a 5 to 15% weighting of gold being discussed at this time. And would that be, are, are you hearing anything in regards to any of the new uh, SDRs, be it the OSDR, the RSDR, or the MSDR? Um, the Chinese, they understand um, very clearly that all these changes will take time. So it's not uh, important what's Chinese wish, it's more important what's politically uh, feasible at this time. So negotiations between China and the West 
hours needed to bring these changes. And I think China, they had been pushing the IMF and the US for the renminbi to be added to the SDR for seven years. So don't expect uh, anything um, to happen very quickly at this time. Uh, I think gold is in the wings, um, waiting in the wings to, to be added to the SDR once a, a confidence crisis will happen. Uh, so it's very easy to bring back confidence to a monetary system by adding gold to the system. I think the um, Chinese and the Americans, they both know that they can revaluate gold. Um, and this will really help to bring back some strength in central bank balance sheets. Uh, but again, this only will happen during the uh, uh, next crisis. Um, so I don't expect this to happen uh, very very soon. With now that the renminbi has been added to the SDR basket of currencies, that kind of changes the dynamics of the of the weighting of the other four mm -hmm. currencies that were already in the SDR basket of currencies. This also changes the dynamics of the weighting of the votes that can be cast within the IMF when they come to the table to discuss policy changes. And do you, how do you see uh, China and Russia and the, the BRICS nations in particular? Because now the understanding that I have, uh, Willem, is that their, their vote now outweighs their com the combination of those countries now outweighs the vote by the United States, and do you, what type of dynamics should we expect to see, if any, uh, in, re in regards to that, as far as what we're discussing, as far as gold coming into the basket of currencies, as far as the next, how to handle the next crisis, and where, how do you see the dynamics of that playing out? Well. Well, it's clear that um, the pressure is mounting from the East. And uh, what's very, very important to understand that China is backing Russia uh, from a geopolitical stand, uh, uh, standpoint uh, totally. So China has never been negative about uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine or the Crimea. And I think China and Russia, they both understand that if they join the forces, they can um, make a um, stand against the U.S. and change the unipolar world into a multipolar world. And to increase this uh, pressure, the Chinese have um, initiated the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, it could be seen, it can be seen as a competitor for the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank. And um, now um, 58 countries are founding partners in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, the U.S. is, um, well, really at risk uh, of losing the initiatives on the international fin financial institutions. And uh, Larry Summers who was a Secretary of the Treasury around 2000, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, he wrote a opinion piece, um, uh, I think one one or two years ago, explaining that the U.S. just lost its uh, role as a underwriter, uh, economic underwriter of the financial system because of all these changes coming from from China. Uh, I do think that um, uh, U.S. is still uh, in control of the decision making within the IMF board because you need a 85% uh, approval for major changes within the international monetary system. And I think uh, the U.S. still has enough votes to, um, to call the shots. But it, it, I just found that to be very, very interesting that, that that is now coming to the table as far as part of the overall dialogue uh, in regards to these major, major policy changes that are happening, that have happened. Yeah, the and pressure is, is increasing quite a bit. 
What's your take on the situation with the new MSDR bond and it it's selling out that the very first issuance has already sold out and there was two and a half times more uh, demand than there were bonds. What's your take on that? Well, it has been quite clear in the last few years that um, there's one problem with the SDR, and that's the lack of liquidity. So we need to develop a um, huge international SDR bond market. And um, during the G20 in China in September, we have seen the first uh, issuance of SDR bonds in China. And uh, the IMF also published a, a press release stating that besides the official SDRs, which are available for uh, southern countries and central bank, um, also uh, MSDRs, like market SDRs, would be available for the private sector. So I think this is a development clearly pointing towards uh, the wish of the IMF, and especially China, to develop a huge liquid SDR market. And uh, don't be surprised in, um, when in a few years' time oil may be priced and be traded in SDRs instead of dollars. And uh, I think this will be a next very big step when um, OPEC countries um, would agree to uh, price their oil in SDRs. I see little reason to, to doubt that OPEC will be moving towards some other form of currency other than the uh, U.S. dollar. I see that coming maybe maybe sooner than the U.S. wishes for it to happen. And I, I think that, that the recent developments with the passing of the 9-11 bill in the United States yeah, right. In conjunction with the previous statements coming out of Saudi Arabia, in particular, saying that if you if you pass that bill, we're going to dump seven hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of treasuries onto the market. And at, uh, when you look at the graph of the Saudi um, treasury holdings, they have been uh, selling quite a bit of U.S. treasuries in the last uh, twelve to eighteen months, just like the Chinese. Yes, and I don't think this is uh, to 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 cause a dollar panic, but it's it's really a sign that they're not increasing the holdings any longer. Maybe don't they don't have the financial uh, possibility to spend a lot more money? But uh, the dollar is at uh, the pressure is increasing on the dollar. We also know that the Russians are decreasing their um, their treasury holdings, so. I think uh, the Federal Reserve still needs to print quite a bit of money. I think so, too. I think that they are continuing to print money. And the understanding that I have is that they're taking the interest that they're making on their on the holdings that they currently have and printing money from that interest that they're earning. But uh, last question, then I want to make a comment and get you to and see, see, get your thoughts on that. But the last question that I have is from uh, my, my friend uh, Rusticus over at uh, Stateless Homesteading. And uh, Willem, do you see any long-term risk to silver's potential return as a monetary metal given its increasing use in industry with no central banks currently stockpiling silver for the Great Reset and Eastern institutions rapidly pouring silver production into green energy like solar, solar panels almost exclusively, do you see a potential future in which gold is allowed to rise while silver remains suppressed? I see a great future for silver because silver is both a monetary metal and it's a commodity which is used in the industry. You know, 60% of world silver is used in the industry and most of it is not even recycled. So uh, most of it is lost. Um, this doesn't happen to gold. So, you know, gold is so expensive that each and every ounce and gram is always recycled. 
Um, I see gold being reintroduced into the monetary system. I see gold being revalued into the monetary system. And silver is poor man's gold. So when gold is uh, getting um, uh, more value and the prices go up, the silver price will follow, and especially in the current gold-silver ratio, which is uh, 70 to 1, it's very hard to envision a silver price which will be lagging uh, the gold price. So I expect silver to rise even more than gold. And we know from historic um, market movements that silver is always a little late to react, but in the end, silver, silver always runs faster and longer than, than, than gold. And I really expect that the very small physical silver market, which is less than $20 billion a year total world silver production, I expect shortages to occur in this market because there are quite uh, a number of um, investors, retail investors, who are sending huge amounts um, of money uh, towards physical silver. And I'm one of them myself. So it's not that important whether silver will be reintroduced as, as money again. I don't expect silver to be reintroduced as money, but I expect silver to be a safe haven assets for high net worth individuals and especially for um, countries like uh, India. Um, we see huge shifts already uh, also among the general public who are not buying as much gold as they used to do, but are, are buying um, a lot more silver. A lot more silver. That's what we want. More physical silver. I like silver a lot. I like gold a lot. And I, I, I agree with your assessment that silver probably will not be uh, returned to a monetary status, but gold probably will at some point in the future. That holding physical silver is uh, key to maintaining one's wealth and being able to prosper as these new policies come online and all these changes that we've been discussing start to unfold and, and become a reality. I think that, and I want to make this comment and then I would like to get, get your thoughts on it. Do you find it curious that Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank and ING and Wells Fargo, all of these are these massive international banks, and they're all seemingly in very deep hot water all at the same time. Right now, all of these things are, are surfacing as the renminbi is being added to the SDR basket of currencies, and I just find that the timing of all of this to be a little curious. I mean, is this something that we should be on the lookout for or does it matter that all these banks are in a lot of trouble all at the same time as these new policies come online? I don't see a direct connection between uh, those two uh, uh, stories, but um, I think we all know that banks have been quite weak especially since the start of the credit crisis. I remember Commerzbank uh, was, a very, was on the brink of collapse almost 10 years ago, was trading at 5 euros. Um, so we only bought time for the banks to recover their balance sheets in the last 7 or 8 years. And some of them um, have uh, strengthened their balance sheet, but don't forget when the world economy is cooling down, especially because China has been cooling off uh, in the last few years. Um, you immediately, immediately you get more stress within the um, banking system, and with with the yields um, that are currently uh, at or near zero, for some of the financial institutions, it becomes real, real difficult to uh, make profits like in the old days. And there's a huge, there are huge uh, bad loans within the banking system. There are huge non-performing loans. Um, uh, so these banks have still a very difficult time in, um, well, trying to cope with all these uh, bad loans. And 
I think that that's the reason why these banks are at risk. And there's a lot of um, contagion risk when one, one bank finds itself in troubles. Um, you see quite a bit of contagion and you see other banks being sold off in uh, equity markets as well. And then you get you, you, you have the risk that you'll uh, end up in, into a negative spiral going downwards. And I think we had a self-inflating spiral upwards since 2009 during the recovery. But the cycle clearly turned and now we're in this... Uh, in this downward spiral again, and that, that, that could become quite vicious. From my perspective, it's nothing but a big fraud. I mean, they've committed these various and sundry acts that have warranted fines across the board by a lot of the big banks. Nothing ever happened to any of the, of the upper management when the situation in 2008 got away from everybody. They took my tax dollars, took your tax dollars, and gave it to these banks in order for them to not fail. And it, it's something something needs to change with that. Mm -hmm. But um, I certainly appreciate all your time, uh, Mr. Middlecope, and I'm not going to take up any more of your time. And we've been speaking with uh, Willem Middlecope, and you can find all of Willem's work over at thebigresetblog.com as well as uh, cdfund.com. And that's for his uh, commodity discovery fund. Willem, thank you very much for your time. And I certainly look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All thank right. You. Well, have a good afternoon and I'll talk to you soon. Same to you. Bye. Bye-bye.